Hey guys, if you like what you're seeing, be sure to click below to subscribe and share. It's not just about the photograph, it's the outdoor experience. Keep in mind everything that you need to know about photography. F-stop, shutter speed, lens selection. Nice photo, I've got beautiful light now. Oh my God. I'm your host, Doug Gardner, and your wild photo adventure starts now. This week, join me and professional wildlife photographer Jared Lloyd as we photograph one of the harshest winter environments on Earth, Yellowstone National Park. Now this park offers great wildlife photography opportunities year-round, but it's winter that is truly the most spectacular time of year to photograph this wildlife. I'm your host, Doug Gardner, and your wild photo adventure starts now. Wow, what a spectacular place, Jared. I mean, this is unbelievable. I'm so glad that 
that President Grant years ago had the wherewithal to protect places like this. I mean, this is really special. Yeah, we're pretty lucky to have this place. You know, it's 2.2 million acres that have been set aside. And it's basically a wildlife photographer's paradise. You know, I'd venture to say that this is the number one photographic destination in, let's say, the lower 48 states here. You know, it's and it's our first national park. You know, 1871 is when Grant set it aside. And uh, it's just as incredible as the day that, you know, they, they put this into place. Well, I'm certainly glad they did. And, and you know, the amount, and the amount of wildlife that you can see, the variety that you can see is, uh, is really spectacular. Well, the variety is, is what's truly spectacular. I mean, this is the only place in the lower 48 states that you have every single species of mammal that was here before Columbus set sail across the ocean. I mean, that's, that's pretty spectacular if yeah. you think about the history of our people on this landscape. And yet, we have that still right here, or at least since we reintroduced the wolf in 1996. Wow. Now, what's the, what kind of population of wolves? Are they doing good? Or? Yeah, they're doing pretty good. We've got probably about 85 to 90 or something around that range right now. Very cool. I'm hoping we'll get a chance to see some of those. Tell you what, daylight's burning. We've got snow rolling in. I want to get some shots of animals in the snow, so let's get out of here. All right, let's do it. This is a beautiful situation. This coyote came in from 600 yards down the river and he walked the edge of the river all the way up jumped over the cattails and now he's just kind of relaxed right here it looks like he's getting ready to pounce on something he's trying to listen doug if you watch the ears of this coyote you'll see that they're just constantly going she'll close her eyes actually because she doesn't even need those things but if you just watch those ears they're constantly twitching moving left moving right moving forward as she's listening for mice below her. This is a little too close for comfort. You don't mind if I'm a I'm a human tripod. <laughs> Sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do. I'll have to say this is a very uncomfortable position. <laughs> Let me prop some snow up for you, man. Both physically and socially. <laughs> but, I mean, it doesn't get much nicer than this. I mean, look at this. Obviously, he's not worried about us here at all. But he's always giving us like a tender moment. And with situations like this, you know, you've got a little bit of time, so always keep a check on your exposure. The light has been going in and out because we got a snowstorm coming in. This is one of those situations where it's real easy to underexpose the scene. You know, when we look at that snow, it's supposed to be white, but if you shoot this at what your meter says it's supposed to be, it's gonna be dark gray. In fact, it's actually gonna be at 18% gray specifically. So uh, with my camera right now, I'm having to overexpose by a stop and a third to get this dialed in just right. Look at the way he's got his paw up. Yeah, that's Jared, I think I'm gonna try to ease down this bank a little bit and see if I can change the angle of view. Um, this is really nice, but you know, we don't know what what kind of angle we got. It may be even more spectacular. So I'm gonna try to ease yeah, down. Slip down there, I'm gonna hold tight right here. Let me know if this behavior changes and tell me to stop. All right, absolutely. Well, that's a perfect example of you got the gamble. Because I moved, when he pounced, I lost that shot. All we can do is wait and see if he does it again. It's starting to snow harder now, and the wind's starting to blow. So we've lost a little bit of light, but still this is turned into from a good scene to a really great scene because now we're showing snow and we can show the environment in which the animal lives in. Doug, did I tell you I like Yellowstone in the winter? 
You know, one of the great things about working in places like Yellowstone National Park in the wintertime is that you get to experience how the animals survive in this brutal environment and the lifestyle that, that they have to live in order to survive this. But the more important thing is, in order for you to get out here and enjoy it, you gotta be able to survive too. So we're gonna go over a few little things that'll, that'll make you more comfortable and possibly save your life. And I guess we should actually start with the layering. That's the most important thing in climates like this is to layer your clothing. Not only does that allow you to shed layers if you're active, if you're doing hiking, um, in, you know, in deep snow and that kind of thing, you're going to build up a sweat. Sweat is what will get you every time. Sweat is the killer because yeah. that sweat will pull uh, body heat away from your body. So being able to shed layers as you need is, is crucial. I have actually three layers on. I started with a smart wool thermal underwear. On top of that, I have polar fleece lined pants. And then on, on the outside, my jacket and my pants, it's a waterproof shell. You're gonna be working in snow and you're gonna be loosening those tripod legs and your tripods are constantly gonna be in the snow. So you, your hands are gonna get wet if you don't have some waterproof gloves. Earlier in the week, I've got severe frostbite and huge cuts, open wounds on my knuckles um, from just my hands being exposed just for a matter of minutes. When you get behind the camera and the situation unfolds in front of you, you have to quickly make that decision. You know, lens length, where I need to be, where I need to position myself. And you know, this stuff, kind of, this scene right here kind of unfolded real quick. At least in my mind, you know, these are iconic animals that, that you think about when you think about the Rockies. Oh, absolutely. Putting your time in and finding a subject, working it and tracking him down and, um, and staying with it, you know, um, it's paid off. Absolutely. It really has. This is classic winter in Yellowstone situation right now. We have bison in extraordinarily deep snow. Um, we waded into this, you know, it was over my waist. I'm six foot two. So, you know, we're dealing with, you know, three, maybe even four feet of snow that I'm seeing these bison trudge through. And as beautiful as the situation is, this can actually be extremely difficult to work. And primarily that's because of how these animals are feeding. And if you watch, you can actually see these bison as they swing their heads back and forth to brush the snow or push the snow out of the way so they can access the grass below them. All the other species of ungulates or hooved mammals that are out here, they'll paw down through the snow, but the bison do things very differently. They use that massive head of theirs to remove the snow to feed in these areas. Because of the depth of the snow, it's oftentimes very difficult to get a clean shot of their face. So you need to be really precise with what you're doing here, and you need to be very cautious of when you trip that shutter button. Because when their heads are down in a two-dimensional plane that we're seeing this in from our cameras, you know, it just it loses the excitement and it loses the drama that we're actually seeing with our eyes. So we want to wait and make sure that we get that head to pop up and maybe even that look straight at the camera, just, just like that right there. And that's when we want to trip the shutter button. In wildlife photography, we're at the mercy of the animals that we're photographing. We're not in a studio. We can't control the scenario. And so inevitably, there's going to be distracting elements that you have to deal with in a situation like this. And in this scenario in particular, we have this beautiful background with these conifers covered in snow, and then you have the occasional dead tree. That's not a problem as long as you account for that tree in your composition. And so you don't want something like this growing out of the bison's head. You want to make sure that you move yourself around or you compose in such a way as to make that dead tree back there part of the composition. The key thing to remember here is that if it doesn't add to the composition, then it actually hurts the composition. And so if you can't figure out a way to work that dead tree into the background, then you just simply need to move or not take a shot at all and wait for the scene to change. 
Now, Jared, this is a nice opportunity here. I mean, it looks like all our hard work paid off. We've seen this guy, what, three times now this week? And he's kind of been in generally the same area. And, you know, taking that extra time this morning to kind of track him, follow his tracks. We had a fresh snow fall last night, so um, it was pretty easy to track him. Yeah, sometimes you just have to put in the time to really work to find these animals. And, you know, we worked our way up and down the Madison River several times here. And luckily, because of that fresh snow, we could tell very quickly which were old tracks and which were fresh tracks. Once we honed in on where those fresh tracks were leading, you know, it was just a matter of getting out of the snow coach, climbing down to the river, and just kind of creeping along with a set of binoculars to find this guy. And lo and behold, there he was, stuffed up inside of a log hanging over the river there. I'm actually very surprised we even, we even saw him because he blended in so well there. Oh, it's perfectly camouflaged. Uh -huh, it looks like he's going to ease down the bank here. I don't know if he's hunting or if, if he's just going to find another place to rest or what. Uh, hopefully he's hunting. You know, one of the unique things about this this particular cat, um, some of the other film crews that were in here, they were specifically in here photographing and filming this particular cat because he, he has a very strange way of, uh, a unique way, I should say, of, of hunting. He will actually dive in the water, and that's very uncommon for um, any of the cat species except for the tiger. Yeah. And um, so this is really unique. It'd be great if we could see him catch a muskrat or something like that, or, or some kind of duck. Yeah, this, this individual bobcat is famous for that. Yeah. Now, just like with the rest of the animals we photographed this week so far, exposing for this, we're doing exactly the same thing. We got full sun on white snow, a lot of white snow. And so I'm metering the snow, and my meter wants to tell me that it's one five thousandths of a second at 5.6 at 100 ISO. But I know that that snow needs to go back to white instead of gray. So I'm gonna open up one full stop which takes my shutter speed down to one twenty-five hundredth of a second. That exposure is coming at dead on for this um, mostly neutral tone cat here. He doesn't seem to be bothered by our presence at all. No, no, not at all. I mean, he's obviously aware that we're here, but you know, coming in like this, kind of digging out something of a hole, nice and slowly, and kind of, you know, getting ourselves down low. We're partially concealed by the snow, and like I said, even though he's very much aware that we're sitting here, by doing this, it, it helps to kind of keep him at ease, and we're able to somewhat mask a lot of our movements here, to where basically it's just our cameras and our heads and hands sticking up above the snow bank, looking at him now. You know, a lot of time with wildlife, um, when animals especially that are not habituated to humans, you know, you do need to wear camouflage. You do need to use blinds. You do need to, you know, try to move as, as quietly and stealthily as, as possible. And a lot of times, something as simple as shade of a tree, mm -hmm. you know, the shade of a forest is sometimes your best color. That's all you need. So this is one of the few situations when I'm photographing in snow that I would actually switch over to aperture priority. Normally, you know, I'm right with Doug. I photograph everything in manual in this sort of scenario. However, right now overhead, we have clouds that are just racing by. There's some really high level winds going on. And so the lighting situation is changing very rapidly. So with the sun coming over our back right now, I'm able to switch my camera over to 3D matrix metering or for cannon shooters that would be evaluative I set a one or plus one exposure compensation and I'll allow the computer inside of the camera to make the decision as to what my shutter speed should be I've got everything set up right now to make sure that that shutter never goes below 1200 and that seems to be just about right for me well Jared it looks like he's easing on down hunting down the edge of the river I'll um, tell you what, you know, let's dig out of here and just kind of follow down the edge of the uh, opposite side of the river here down the bank and just try to keep up with it. Yeah, that's all we can do right now. Anytime you're photographing a bird like this in this sort of tight cover up in a tree, you know, this sort of overcast lighting that we have right now is absolutely perfect. If we had any sort of sun out right now, we would have harsh 
highlights and very deep shadows. And that's a dynamic range that your camera just wouldn't be able to handle. So overcast lighting when working in forested situations or working with birds and trees is the absolute perfect type of lighting. And what I like to do in this sort of scenario, I'll drop my aperture down to f4, my f-stop down to f4. That's going to give me an extremely narrow depth of field. And when shooting with these longer lenses like this, and especially at close distances, you have to be surgically precise with your focusing. If I were to focus just below the eye on the neck or part of the shoulder at f4 like this, at such a narrow depth of field, that eye would actually be out of focus. And of course, as everybody knows, the eye is the most important part of the subject. Now, technically, just a few years ago, this species of grouse didn't even exist. This is what we used to call the blue grouse here, but it's since been divided into two species, the dusky and the sooty grouse, in which case we're watching the dusky grouse right now. Now, it's really interesting if you watch this guy sitting in this tree here, he's actually reaching out and plucking needles from this uh, conifer here. And that's, that's something that's very unique about this species here, and that's how they survive the winter. And there's very few species of any sort of animal that can survive off of this sort of stuff. Whoa, 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 stop, 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 right here, right here. All right, there's something under those trees right there. Doug, this might actually be a wolf. Let's check this out. And Doug, look at this. We were driving up the road. You said you thought you saw a coyote. It looked a little big to me. You know, we pull up. Beautiful example of a gray wolf here tucked under these trees right now. This is absolutely gorgeous. It is gorgeous. You know, it's not a photograph. No, but, by no uh, means. By but, no. I mean, he's behind the tree. He's got a lot of stuff in the way. But just the opportunity to see this magnificent animal I mean, they're, they're elusive. They don't want to be near people. And just to be this close to one is, is really special. Oh yeah, this is what winter in Yellowstone is all about right here. And that guy's on a, uh, on a kill. Yeah. yeah. Or at least uh, looks like a, a rack of ribs right there that she's got. Barbecued uh, maybe? <laughs> all right, uh, let's go ahead and let her be and uh, we'll keep on moving here. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So Doug, after the creation of the National Park, uh, Congress realized that the political boundaries, that's Yellowstone, doesn't actually encompass the entire ecosystem. So what they ended up doing was surrounding the entire National Park with national forests, okay. which are all fantastic places to photograph, like we're in right now. Well, I mean, even though we're not in the park, technically, boy, this is beautiful up through here. These animals, they don't, they don't know the boundaries, and that's the cool thing about this. Oh my gosh, dude. Wow, this is really nice. The sun's gonna be dropping out of the way here shortly though, but for the time being, this is, this is a great situation. Yeah, this is gorgeous. I'd like to take this opportunity to explain to you how to determine exposure for neutral tone subjects in snow. Now, it doesn't matter what the lighting situation is. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's overcast or if it's full sun. The, the process is gonna be the same. The only thing that's gonna change is how much you compensate uh, your exposure. So basically what you wanna do is you want to point your camera's meter, which is the center part of your viewfinder, at the white snow that is in the same light as your subject. Depress your shutter halfway down, which activates the meter, and start adjusting your f-stop and your shutter speed in ISO to the, until the meter on the inside of the camera reads zero. That's a neutral tone exposure. The camera's meter is built to determine a neutral tone exposure. It basically says that everything you pointed at is neutral gray, and that's not the case. The snow is white, it's not gray. We don't want gray snow. So we want to compensate our exposure. In order to bring the snow back to white, we have to add light to it. So my meter right now is telling me that 1 16th hundredth of a second at 5.6 and 400 ISO is a proper exposure for that snow. That is not correct. That's gonna give me gray snow. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add light by simply adjusting my shutter speed down to 1 800th of a second. By doing that now, I've opened my exposures up. The snow is pretty and white and the elk will be properly exposed. Well, we got a bit of a drive to get out of here though, Doug, so we should probably go ahead and shoulder the tripod. I don't wanna leave out. this though, but I don't wanna be left here. It's, yeah, it's, you don't wanna be already... wolf food either. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you. Let's All right, out. let's do it.
Well, I think it goes without saying. The wildlife photography opportunities here are truly amazing. And the brutal winter weather these animals have to endure gives us a greater appreciation for these animals. I hope you've enjoyed this week's show and learned a little more about winter photography in Yellowstone National Park. More information about this show is available online. And remember, it's not just about the photograph, it's the outdoor experience. I'm your host, Doug Gardner. Thank you for joining me on another edition of Wild Photo Adventures. I am a buffalo. Cuckoo, cuckoo. Doug, I think you're taking the easy route here. Yeah, I'm following the buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys ready to get out of here? Oh god. I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> oh, his knees are frozen. This is what we used to call a brook. A, a brew grass. A brew, this is what we call a brew grass. <laughs> hey guys, if you like what you're seeing, be sure to click below to subscribe and share.